concludes portfolio questions. We'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Michael Matheson on a strategic review of undercover, undercover policing by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so uh, I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Michael Matheson. Thank you, President Officer. Before I turn to undercover policing, I would like to update members on recent policing developments. As members will be aware, Phil Gormley has today tendered his resignation from the post of Chief Constable and will leave Police Scotland with immediate effect. I respect the decision of the Chief Constable and hope this enables policing in Scotland to move forward with a clear focus on delivering the long-term strategy, Policing 2026, that Phil Gormley helped to develop. While the management of the police service has been the subject of close scrutiny in recent months, I'd like to pay tribute to all of those officers who have continued to serve the people of Scotland every day, helping to keep crime at historically low levels and making our communities safer. I've spoken with Susan Deacon, Chair of the Scottish Police Authority, which will undertake the process of appointing a new Chief Constable. Pre Professor Deacon informed me yesterday that the Scottish Police Authority were in discussions with the Chief Constable's representatives regarding his future and provided assurance that the appropriate processes were being followed. Going forward, I'm encouraged by the commitment she has made to improving the robustness of decision-making in the Scottish Police Authority. Today, President Officer, I laid before Parliament the HMICS report on undercover policing. I'd like to thank HMICS for this strategic review, which I directed to be undertaken in September 2016. The report makes 19 recommendations, and Police Scotland has undertaken to implement all of these. I received HMICS's report on the 2nd of November and I've taken my time to consider carefully all of the report and what it has to say. Members may be aware of the ongoing judicial review into these matters. This has also had a bearing on, my, on the time taken to consider the report. The report says, and I quote, the use of undercover officers is a legitimate policing tactic and has been used effectively in Scotland. Operational activity has primarily focused on drug-related offences, child sexual abuse and exploitation, human trafficking and exploitation, and serious organised crime. The report makes clear that since 2000, the use of the undercover policing tactic has not been widespread in Scotland. It states, and I quote, the number of undercover deployments by Scottish policing leads us to the conclusion that the use of undercover policing in Scotland cannot be considered to be widespread. Indeed, we believe that undercover advanced officers and undercover online officers have been underutilised. The report also goes on to note that, and I quote, there was no evidence that undercover advanced officers from Police Scotland had infiltrated social justice campaigns or that officers had operated out with the perimeters of the authorisation. Members will be aware of the undercover policing inquiry, the UCPI, which is taking place in England and Wales. Its stated purpose is to investigate and report on undercover police operations conducted by English and Welsh police forces in England and Wales since 1968, including the full scope of undercover policing, the work of the Special Demonstra Demonstration Squad, the SDS, and the National Public Order Intelligence Unit, the NPOIU. A number of issues led to the instigation of the 2000 and 2014 of this inquiry by the then Home Secretary. These included Mark Kennedy, 
a former Metropolitan Police officer attached to the NPOIU, had infiltrated protest groups between 2003 and 2010. Uh, uh, in, two, in 2011, a Guardian article claimed that undercover officers routinely adopted a tactic of promiscuity. We have heard in previous debates in this chamber about undercover officers having long-term relationships with members of the groups they had infiltrated. In 2012, Theresa May appointed Mark Ellison QC to carry out a review of the police investigation into the murder of Stephen Lawrence for the purpose of examining allegations reported in the media that the investigation had been tainted by corruption. In 2014, Theresa May told the House of Commons that the findings of Mark Ellison and of Operation Hearn, a review of the Special Demonstration Squad had persuaded her of the need for a judge-led public inquiry into undercover policing. The accumulation of revelations of highly questionable and unethical behaviours eventually led to the establishment of the undercover policing inquiry. They all relate to English police forces which fall within the ultimate responsibility of the Home Secretary. Despite the evidence that the SDS and the NPOIU had been active in Scotland, the terms of reference for the undercover policing inquiry did not and do not extend to Scotland. I wrote on a number of occasions to Theresa May and Amber Rudd, stating that I was disappointed that the terms of reference for the undercover policing inquiry would not be extended to allow it to consider the evidence of these English and Welsh units' activity in Scotland. In her letter of January 2016, Theresa May wrote that the inquiry is, and I quote, interested in the whole story and are bound to encourage those coming forward to provide a complete picture when submitting their evidence. Despite this resp that response, neither Mrs May nor her successor saw fit to amend the terms of reference in order to allow that whole story to be considered. The HMICS report confirms that undercover officers from the SDS and the NPOIU were active in Scotland. This activity, however, was not as we understand it, standalone and not self-contained within Scotland. Nor did it have any particular Scottish focus. There was nothing that set it aside as something distinctive from the unit's activities which were being considered by the undercover policing inquiry. These units, undercover units officers, it required to be authorised. The HMICS review confirmed that, with the exception of a number of authorisations made around G8, it was authorised under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, RIPA. This is the appropriate statute for the authorisation of activity by law enforcement bodies in England and Wales. The review comments that a number of G8 authorisations were dual authorised under RIPA and the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act 2000 RIPSA. My understanding is that this was done as a belts and braces approach and that the RIPSA authorisation, which were made by Tayside Police, were effectively a subset of the wider RIPA authorisations. These authorisations would have been subject to oversight at the time by the Office of Surveillance Commissioners. RIPA allows for the authorised activity to cross the border north into Scotland, but it does so with one important caveat. It can only do so so long as not all the activity authorised takes place in Scotland. In simple terms, 
the activity of these English and Welsh undercover officers in Scotland was authorised as part of an operation that began or mainly took place south of the border. In 2005, the SDS and NPOIU officers were deployed to in support of the Scottish police operation for the G8 summit at Glen Eagles. The HMICS review states, and I quote, the SDS, the NPOIU, and other deployments of undercover officers at the G8 summit were undertaken with the full knowledge, cooperation, and authorization of Tayside Police. Out with the policing of the G8 summit, the undercover deployments by the SDS and the NPOIU to Scotland were the responsibility of the SDS and NPOIU. The report makes clear that out with G8, Scottish police forces were unsighted on SDS and NPOIU operations in Scotland. I welcome the HMICS recommendation that Police Scotland should, in partnership with the relevant UK bodies, establish a formal process for the reciprocal notification of cross-border undercover operations. Members in this chamber and others have called on the Scottish Government to establish a Scottish inquiry. Both the Scottish and UK governments are currently subject to a judicial review relating to the undercover policing inquiry. This case is currently in court, so I cannot go into detail about that, but the basis of the case is a matter of public record. It challenges the UK government on its decision not to extend the undercover policing inquiry to cover Scotland. And it challenges the Scottish Government because we have not held a 2005 Act inquiry with similar terms of reference in Scotland. The HMICS strategic review was always going to be instrumental in forming my decision on how to respond to calls for a separate Scottish inquiry. We have seen no evidence of the sort of behaviour by Scottish police forces that led to the establishment of the undercover policing inquiry. The HMICS review provides reassurance to the public and to this parliament around the extent and scale of the use of undercover police officers since 2000, identifies room for improvement and makes a number of recommendations that Police Scotland have committed to implement in full. I've considered carefully whether I should establish a separate Scottish inquiry under the Inquiries Act. In all the circumstances, I am not satisfied that establishing a separate inquiry is necessary or in the public interest. There is some legitimate public concern around undercover policing activity in Scotland, and I've had regard to those concerns in reaching a decision on this matter. However, on balance, I consider that establishing a Scottish inquiry under the 2005 Act into undercover policing is not necessary or justified. The factors that have led me to that view include the lack of evidence of any systemic failings within undercover policing in Scotland, and in light of the limited scale of the activities of SDS and NPOIU police officers in Scotland, I believe setting up a further inquiry would not be a proportionate response. I believe such an inquiry would inevitably create a measure of duplication with the undercover policing inquiry by involving many of the same core participants, law enforcement officers, and has the potential to overlap in its conclusions and remedies. It could, because of the scale and duration of the undercover policing inquiry, be subject to potential delay in obtaining Metropolitan Police Service participation and documentation, and would be disproportionate in terms of costs. Responsibility for the actions of English and Welsh police units sits with the UK Government, London's Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, and the relevant Chief Officers. 
The Scottish Government's position remains that the clearest and most effective way of addressing concerns about what may have happened in Scotland as a result of actions of English and Welsh police officers is for the terms of reference for the undercover policing inquiry to be amended to allow it to look at the activity of English and Welsh police, or police operations which took place across Great Britain. Accordingly, I have today written again to the Home Secretary to ask her to reconsider those terms of reference and have provided her with a copy of HMICS's strategic review. I can provide Parliament with the assurance that any recommendations that arise from the undercover policing inquiry will be considered and, where appropriate and necessary, will be implemented in Scotland. I have every sympathy for individuals if they have suffered due to the actions of undercover police officers who have behaved in ways that are entirely unethical and unacceptable. However, I am clear on the basis of the evidence that we have that such behaviour by police officers in English and Welsh units is properly a matter for the Home Secretary and the most effective way for the undercover policing inquiry to see the whole story and complete picture that the current Prime Minister referred to previously is for the inquiry to be allowed to consider all of the relevant evidence. Thank you very much. Before calling members, I'll just uh, draw members' attention to a couple of points. The Cabinet Secretary referred to the ongoing judicial review in relation to the independent inquiry on undercover, undercover policing. I have received advice on this and I have reached the view that the sub judice rule does not apply and I will therefore allow questions on the issues the Cabinet Secretary raises, has raised in his statement. I am also conscious of the greater, greater level of interest in the statement uh, from members following the Cabinet Secretary's points following, following the points that the Cabinet Secretary has raised about the resignation of the Chief Constable and I will allow some additional time to accommodate members. A point of order from Neil Findlay. Mr. President, officer, I wonder if uh, in uh, deliberations that the Cabinet Secretary, who said that he would not comment on the case that was in court, whether the time would be allowed for him now to comment about that case. Members are at liberty to ask questions and the Cabinet Secretary himself can decide how to respond appropriately to those questions. So we'll begin with question number one from Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. I also thank HMICS for carrying out this important review, which this party supported. It is absolutely vital that undercover policing is carried out in a proportionate, authorised and lawful manner. And it's important that we recognise this report's findings that undercover policing is not widespread and has been carried out within the law. It is a legitimate tactic which has led to the arrest of many serious criminals. With that in mind, given the report's comment on Police Scotland's lack of capacity in relation to serious organised crime and online safety, what work is being done to address this? And in relation to recommendation 19, when does the Minister expect a formal process of notification for cross-border operations to be put in place? Can he explain why such a process was not already in place and what discussions is he having with the UK Government Policing Minister on that matter? Finally, uh, turning to the Chief Constable's resignation, Mr Gormley has said that it was the events of and since November last year when the Cabinet Secretary interfered in the SPA's operational decision that has made it impossible for him to continue. So does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge his part in this decision? And will the Justice Secretary now finally do the decent thing and follow the former Chief Constable out of the door? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'll deal with his last part and I'll uh, leave Liam Kerr to the amateur politics yeah. around this issue and I'll deal with the serious politics of this issue. Um, uh, and I think to misinterpret it, interpret someone's statement like that as well is actually very seriously misleading um, as well. Let me deal with his more substantive points, his more reasonable points, and that is the lack of capacity around uh, uh, advanced uh, undercover policing in particular areas such as serious and organised crime and online issues. The member will appreciate these are entirely operational matters for Police Scotland, and it's entirely a matter for the Chief Constable to determine how these issues are taken forward rather than being directed by ministers. I think what the report does demonstrate is there is a need for Police Scotland to look at these issues and Police Scotland have already accepted the 19 recommendations 
and have a steering group in place who are considering all of these issues. In relation to cross-border matters, um, it would obviously uh, be uh, preferential to have had a cross-border arrangement in, uh, in previous uh, years. Uh, however, we have two distinctive uh, elements of legislation dealing with this matter. Um, and Police Scotland are now pursuing that matter with the relevant law enforcement bodies in the rest of the UK to seek to put in place an appropriate mechanism. I will also consider uh, whether any representations need to be made to UK ministers on ensuring that that recommendation is taken forward. But I'm confident in the commitment that Police Scotland have given that they are determined to work with other law enforcement bodies in other parts of the UK to get a mechanism in place. It will require changes in both Scottish legislation and also in auth codes of practice and also a, a codes of practice for other parts of the UK. So it's not something that we can put in place unilaterally here in Scotland alone, but it's one which will have to be agreed across the whole of the UK. But it's a very practical, sensible recommendation and Police Scotland have given a commitment to taking it forward. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. But can I say that I think it's disappointing that the Minister has chosen to conflate two important issues into a single statement this afternoon. And I would ask him to come back to this place so that we can have further time to discuss the leadership and governance of Police Scotland. Now, on undercover policing, the officers involved deserve our thanks for voluntarily putting themselves in challenging and sometimes dangerous circumstances for the public good. And we welcome the review insofar as it provides a series of useful strategic recommendations to improve capacity and oversight of undercover policing. But there remain unanswered questions. Was there infiltration in social justice campaigns before the formation of Police Scotland? What about undercover uh, activity before the year 2000? And what has been the impact on those targeted by undercover policing, their friends and their family, which is such a large part of the controversy in England and Wales? Those questions remain unanswered. So can the Cabinet Secretary please answer why, he, in light of this, he won't commit to an independent inquiry? But turning to the Chief Constable's resignation, it is a sign of, of, of strength that our police officers continue to do a diligent uh, job, despite the shambles regarding the, police, uh, the governance of Police Scotland. But the Cabinet Secretary uh, may want to draw a line after today's resignation, but he, the, the Chief Constable refers directly to the events of November 2017. And so does the Cabinet Secretary concede that those events that Mr Gormley refers to are his interventions? And is so, is he concerned that his actions may have prejudiced the Chief Constable's return? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, also, uh, let me um, uh, first of all uh, just correct the point that was made by Daniel Johnson about trying to conflate two different issues. I, I suspect had I come in here and made a statement and made no reference to yeah, the resignation yeah, of the Chief yeah, Constable, yeah. people would think that is completely yeah. bizarre, that you should have ignored such an issue. I'm not trying to conflate two issues, I'm merely just making reference to the fact that such a significant policing issue uh, arose today. And to, Let's hear the and Cabinet to, Secretary, please. And to suggest otherwise, I must confess, is rather bizarre on the part of uh, Daniel Johnston. So let me, um, let me now deal with, uh, let me now deal with the, the issues that, that, that Daniel Johnston attempted to raise. And I've said that I acknowledge that there is some legitimate public concern around undercover policing activities in Scotland. As I said in my statement, and I've got regard, giving regard to those in the reaching the decision I have made on it, I've given very clear indication as to what factors I took into account in arriving at a decision on whether an inquiry should take place here in Scotland. A lack of evidence of any systemic failings within undercover policing in Scotland. The limited scale of the activity of the SDS and MPOIU police officers in Scotland. I believe that an inquiry would inevitably create measures of duplication with the undercover policing inquiry in England and Wales and would involve many of the same core participants, um, law enforcement officers, uh, and has the potential to overlap in its conclusions and its remedies. Uh, and it could be, uh, because of the scale and the duration of the UCP, uh, I, uh, that it could be subject in, uh, to significant delay here in Scotland because of uh, obtaining information from the Metropolitan Police Service uh, and those participating in that particular process. And I'm also very clear that the activities of uh, police officers from England and Wales rest with the Home Secretary on these matters. And it's clear from what I can see in the HMICS report that the activities relating to the SDS and also the NPOIU rest with largely UK-based operations that were authorised 
under their processes and should be considered as part of the undercover policing investigation. But what I can also say to the member that if information does become available, uh, particularly during the course of the undercover police inquiry, that does relate to Scotland, then I would, of course, give that full consideration and consider whether any further measures are necessary here in Scotland. Yep. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. Oh, sir. What impact does the Cabinet Secretary envisage this report will have in the future of undercover policing activities in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So, and also, the range of recommendations which have been set out in the HMICS strategic review, um, I believe, will help to strengthen the way in which uh, Police Scotland take forward any undercover uh, policing operations, because it is a legitimate tactic uh, that can be used in order to deal with issues of public order, serious and organised crime, sexual exploitation, child abuse matters, and it has a legitimate role in helping to tackle some of these very serious forms of criminal uh, activity. But equally, it's also important we have robust legislative processes around how it operates. And that's exactly what the regulation for investigating the powers provisions are for and the new codes of practice, which I just took through Parliament eh, last week to the Justice Committee to make sure that we have robust measures in place for eh, dealing with these issues and for operational eh, responsibility around Police Scotland in utilising these tactics. But I believe the additional recommendations from HMICS will allow us to strengthen that process even further and to give even further assurance about the way in which police service, the police service in Scotland utilises this tactic. Margaret Mitchell, to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Regardless of the rights or wrongs of the complaints against Phil Gormley, this issue and the Cabinet Secretary intervention into the SPA decision about the CC's special leave have at best been handled appallingly. Will the Cabinet Secretary confirm if he has replied to the letter of 28th of November to him from Mr Gormley's solicitors? And if not, why not? If so, and when does he respond, uh, intend to do so? And if so, um, what did the re response say? In terms of the, um, the report today of undercover policing, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm, given he's been in receipt of this uh, since 2nd of November, some 14 weeks ago, if he made any changes to the report's content, and if so, what changes were made. And of the 50 undercover operations since the formation of Police Scotland in 2013, the report states operational activity has primarily... Mr Mitchell, I'm sorry, but that, that, that's too many questions. If the Cabinet okay, Secretary answered the first two questions. Uh, so, officer, in relation to changes in regard to the report, no, there have been no changes made to the report. Um, uh, my understanding is, as would normally be the process for dealing with reports of this nature, is that it would be shared with, uh, it would be shared with Police Scotland for factual accuracy uh, checking, which would be the normal protocol for dealing with reports of this nature. But there were no changes in it uh, requested on my part. Can I deal with the other issue that the member raised regarding uh, the matter uh, in relation to the former Chief uh, Constable and uh, the letter which he his laws of my accountability is to this parliament uh, in these matters and I've answered questions in this parliament on a number of occasions on this issue um, on that but what I can also say is that um, there have been significant things have happened uh, since uh, November I was very clear about the process that the SPA had in place there had serious deficiencies within it that's not just my view it's the view of the new chair of the Scottish Police Authority who having reviewed it has stated that she has found it wanting in many many uh, ways the fact that the perk had not been consulted during the course of a live investigation, that no welfare arrangements had been put in place for complainants within the organisation, which we now know was yeah. the case, uh, and at the same time that the existing Deputy Chief Constable designate, Ian Livingston, um, had not been uh, consulted or engaged in the planning around this process um, at all. So I've been very clear that there have been serious deficiencies, and it was unacceptable, those deficiencies in that particular uh, process. Um, I'm also conscious, as I said, that there have been two further complaints um, uh, since, uh, since, the, uh, since November as uh, well. And there's been significant media and public uh, commentary around all of these issues and an intensity around uh, the complaints process in itself. But I'm very clear that my actions in questioning the SPA um, on the 9th of November were entirely appropriate and indeed were expected of me. And I have got absolutely no doubt had I asked yeah. no questions of that process, the member would have been in here haranguing me time and time again for not having asked some basic questions. 
and that demonstrated the deficiency in the process that not only have I identified, the new chair of the SPA has also identified. Rona Mc... Point of, point of order, Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, given that you said at the beginning of the statement that extra time had been allocated to allow uh, the two issues to be dealt with in the cabinet secretary's statement, could I question why the response to Daniel Johnson did not in any way, shape or form address his question about the Chief Constable? And given that we now do seem to have uh, time constraints on questions, which is highly surprising when two issues are trying to be dealt with in the one statement, could I ask if, uh, presiding officer, you would, would now be amenable to the Cabinet Secretary returning to the Chamber to address the issue of the issues around the Chief Constable's resignation? First of all, I thank the member for the point of order. That, that's not a point of order for the Chair. These are legitimate questions the member is entitled to ask. There are many parliamentary opportunities which all members can take advantage of. They can put down written questions, they can write to the government. If they wish to have further parliamentary time, that's a matter for your business manager through the parliamentary bureau to discuss. Uh, I have allowed additional time, but may I point out that this exchange, these exchanges between each question, the questions are slightly too long and the answers are slightly too long. So if we're going to get through some of the questions are asked, I'd ask all members and the Cabinet Secretary to be a little more succinct. Uh, Rona Mackay to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What impact has the creation of Police Scotland had on undercover policing in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, um, as the HMICS report demonstrates, is that Police Scotland have sought to uh, take a much more strategic, centralised approach to how they manage undercover policing in Scotland, so there's a much more consistent approach uh, to how undercover policing is utilised uh, within the force uh, as to what we had previously with eight legacy uh, forces uh, on that matter. Uh, so there has been a much more strategic approach taken forward in making sure there's a consistency in how undercover policing is addressed. Can I turn to the issue about Daniel Johnson's question about the Chief Constable? It was an oversight on my part in responding to the issues. But I'm conscious these are issues that he's raised with me now on several occasions. And the answer remains the same, is that the challenges and the issues that I raised with the SPA on the 9th of November were perfectly legitimate about the deficiencies in their process. And anyone looking at the evidence that we've now heard in this parliament around the deficiencies that were in that process yeah. are very, very clear and were unacceptable, as I have said time and time again. And I consistently believe that that was the right action in asking them to consider these matters. And that's why the former chair made it clear that they would go and they would consider these issues in making a decision. Yeah. It is also worth reflecting on the fact that since that time in November, the SPA have now considered this issue on four separate occasions and decided to continue with the Chief Constable's leave during each of those considerations. So they have revisited these matters and came to a judgment on these issues. But the questions that the member asked me has asked them on several occasions and the answers remain the same. Yeah. Neil Findlay to be followed by Ben McPherson. By refusing a public inquiry or to look beyond the year 2000, the Cabinet Secretary fails victims, many of them women, and fails our democracy. Now the only people on the mainland UK who will not have access to justice are Scottish victims. How is this standing up for Scotland? Because it seems that the rights of the general public in Scotland to get to the truth and justice about these issues rest in the hands of one activist, Tilly Gifford, who, as you know, is bringing a judicial review against the Scottish and UK governments for the failure to hold a public inquiry where Scots can have access to that inquiry. So will you do the right thing by the people of Scotland and establish a public inquiry now because the police inspecting the police in this whitewash simply will not do. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I've already set out uh, the reasons why I don't believe it's necessary or proportionate to have a public inquiry into this matter uh, here in Scotland. And I am aware of many of those who have got concerns about uh, what happened here in Scotland are core participants in the undercover policing inquiry which is taking place in England and Wales. It's also very clear, as I said, they are core participants, most of them, in the undercover inquiry that's taking place in England. And that will allow them to be able to make their case. But even with that, it's very clear from this review that's been conducted by HMICS is that these were matters that relate to units within English and Welsh police forces and jurisdiction and responsibility for those matters rests with the Home Secretary yep. and that's why the undercover policing inquiry should take that into account in its remit. Ben McPherson to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that 
because the report found, and I quote, no evidence that undercover advanced officers from Police Scotland had operated out with the parameters of the authorisation in undercover operations, the, this key finding demonstrates that this element of policing in Scotland is functioning proficiently with officers behaving in the way their superiors and, importantly, the public would expect. Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so the uh, report highlights, uh, I believe, what uh, they found uh, to be undercover officers who had a strong view that there were a number of uh, clear safeguards in place for ensuring that uh, ethical standards were maintained uh, when they were being deployed in undercover operations. And one of the key findings uh, records that undercover officers within Police Scotland understood the requirements, the legal requirements set out within the regulation for investigatory powers uh, Scotland Act and also the codes of practice uh, which go alongside that. Members will also aware that the codes of practice were changed back in 2014 in order to increase the threshold uh, for authorisations for some of these uh, matters, moving to a, an assistant chief constable. And if the, the surveillance operation goes on for an extended period of time, uh, authorisation requiring also uh, the, uh, the, the investigatory powers commissioner uh, and a deputy chief constable to give uh, authorisation to these matters. So I believe that the report does demonstrate the significant safeguards that we have in place uh, here in Scotland and also uh, the ethical standards which are expected of undercover officers within Police Scotland. John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of, of uh, his, his statement. Um, the Cabinet Secretary would ordinarily have an evidence base for his decision making. I have to say, I don't believe he's delivered that in this instance, and I will give two examples why. In the statement, you talk about the limited scale of activities of the SDS and NPOI. You talk about out with G8 Scottish forces being unsighted uh, on these activities. But the most damning a feature I thought you would have picked up on and used as evidence to support having uh, an inquiry, Cabinet Secretary, is, if, if I may, it's a very short quote uh, uh, from paragraph 166. It says, our conclusions in relation to SDS deployments were based on the examination of SDS records heard by, held by um, Operation Hearn, which is a metropolitan policeman, which stretched back over 40 years. Unfortunately, it is not possible to establish if the material obtained by Operation Hearn is entirely accurate or comprehensive, and if it, it is probable that given the passage of time and the likelihood of human, human, record, uh, human error that some records are missing or inaccurate, I guarantee they'll be missing and inaccurate. Cabinet Secretary, you need to take charge of this situation. You need to call an inquiry. You need to assert your independence in relation to this. This is a Scottish matter. Please deal with it. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so the, the report states that they did examine the scale and extent of the NPOIU operations in Scotland and they also uh, had the cooperation of the National Police Chief Council's uh, National Coordination Team, which is part of Operation Hearn, uh, around looking at the documentation relating to a number of these issues. Uh, the member will be aware uh, that the report also recognises that some of this information is provisional as it stands at the present moment. Uh, based upon what are quite literally millions of documents that are presently being indexed uh, and analysed um, as part of the preparations for the undercover policing operation. That's why I've made a comment uh, that if there is new evidence or information that comes to light uh, in due course regarding undercover policing operations uh, with police officers here in Scotland, then I will give due regard to that. But as it stands at the present, as it stands at the present moment, based on the information that HMICS have been able to get access to that is available to them as part of that documentation process, I don't believe that that's sufficient evidence that justifies establishing a public inquiry at this stage. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement, but can I uh, echo the comments of uh, John Finney, uh, express my uh, disappointment at his decision not to instigate a public inquiry here in Scotland and urge him uh, to reconsider that. Meantime, the confirmation of the Chief Constable's resignation, uh, does he not accept that no matter who is appointed to head up Police Scotland and the SPA, the problems are hardwired into the structures uh, of policing thanks to a botched centralisation? And will he now agree to establish an independent expert group to come forward with proposals that inject accountability, transparency and localism back into the system? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, Sign officer, in relation to his uh, first point regarding the uh, uh, undercover police inquiry, again, I've made it very clear as to the rationale and my reasoning for arriving at that dec decision. I recognise that there are members in the chamber that don't agree with that, but I've reached it on the basis of the evidence that is contained within the HMICS uh, report. Uh, and I've said as well that um, should uh, new information become available, uh, particularly during the course of the undercover police inquiry, if it's not extended to include uh, issues relating to uh, English and Welsh police units operating in Scotland, uh, then, uh, then I will give uh, full consideration uh, to that in uh, due course. In relation to uh, the matters relating to um, uh, the SPA and Police Scotland, can I say that I don't believe they are necessarily uh, hardwired and it's also been very clear that the new chair is keen not to get into a situation where she feels things that have been reviewed to death that she is given the space and the scope to be able to move the organisation forward in a way that is uh, much more engaging both with parliament and also with uh, local elected members and with the uh, other interested parties and stakeholders in uh, Scotland and I think it's in all of our interest to give Susan Deakin uh, an opportunity to uh, to take that forward and to give them the space in order to uh, make progress in some of these matters which she said very clearly she wishes to uh, do so in a very uh, as quick a manner as uh, possible. No doubt, as a member of the uh, policing subcommittee, he'll be keen to scrutinise uh, the new chair on uh, how they are moving it forward and the speed at which they are moving that forward. Can I also say in relation to Police Scotland is that um, I recognise there's been a significant focus on uh, the Chief Constable and the senior management team within uh, Police Scotland, but it's also worth reflecting on the uh, comments that were recently made by Deputy Chief Constable designate Ian Livingston about the performance of Police Scotland over recent months, where it continues to perform exceptionally well uh, and how they handled a whole range of events over the festive period. Um, as well with the all uh, homicides all uh, uh, being uh, solved or uh, remaining uh, having been dealt with and the way in which they've responded to other major challenges as well uh, and how uh, officers have continued to perform their duties to an excellent standard and I, uh, I hope as of today uh, we'll be able to get more of a focus on to uh, the organisation moving forward with its 2026 strategy and the improvements and changes that the new chair of the SPA um, is keen to take forward at a pace. Marie Goujon to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Does the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary believe that the advice and guidance for police officers engaging in undercover work is sufficient? Cabinet Secretary. Well, sign officer, I've already set out that the, some new guidance has just been issued around um, uh, the regulation of investigatory powers uh, codes of practice, which were approved by Parliament just uh, uh, last week in this matter. I believe that the existing uh, legislative framework is robust. Uh, and fit for purpose and it provides the necessary safeguards on authorisation. Uh, that has changed since 2014 in terms of the thresholds for authorisation have uh, been increased. Also the checks that have to now be made against with the, what was the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner to now the Investigatory Powers uh, Commissioner uh, for any longer term investigations. Uh, and clearly, where people have a concern around uh, surveillance matters, that they believe that if it's been act they've been under surveillance on, uh, and that they have questions or uh, concerns about that, then there is a process for escalating those concerns. Uh, and that process is through the, uh, uh, the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office uh, and with the scope to go into an Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Uh, that can consider these issues in details and, if necessary, uh, can issue findings against the relevant authorities uh, for actions to be taken if they have acted in a way which is uh, unethical and inappropriate. So there are additional safeguards there for individuals where they have concerns about how uh, some of these matters uh, uh, may be getting taken forward, not just by Police Scotland, uh, but by any public authority that does have uh, the provisions to be able to actually undertake some form of surveillance. Gordon Linders, <coughs> followed by Stuart Stevenson. As the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that all 19 of these not insubstantial recommendations uh, will be implemented by Police Scotland, can you also give the Chamber an indication of what this will cost and where the monies to do so will come from? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, any costs associated with it will come from within existing budgets, and the time frame for taking them forward is an operational matter for Police Scotland. What I can say to the member is that the steering group that's been established by Police Scotland has um, representatives from HMICS on it in order to consider the progress and the work that they are taking forward. And I would expect, as very often HMICS uh, do in these cases, very often provide an update on the progress that's been made against recommendations that they've made in individual reports. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, inter alia recommendations 8 and 14 relate to the security of record keeping 
Will the Cabinet Secretary work with the Scottish Police Authority to ensure that a dual key approach is implemented to ensure that no single individual can gain access to the most sensitive records, whether in a secure computer system or otherwise? Cabinet Secretary. So, and also the keeping of records in relation to surveillance matters is governed by the regulation um, of Investigatory Powers uh, Act and the Investigatory Powers Act here in Scotland and also the codes of practice um, that are associated with uh, that piece of legislation. Uh, these responsibilities are also subject to annual inspection which is carried out by the what was previously the um, Office of the Surveillance Commissioner but which is now carried out by uh, the independent judicially led uh, Investigatory Powers uh, Commissioner's Office. Uh, and any findings that they have in relation to uh, the uh, storing and retention of data relating to these types of operations is something that they report directly to um, at Police Scotland on and also can feature in their uh, annual reports, uh, as has been the case in the past, uh, where they have uh, identified uh, deficiencies relating to uh, forces in the UK. So the uh, provisions in relation to uh, the matters which the member has raised uh, are governed by the existing uh, regulation for investigative appeals, uh, Scotland Act and the codes of practice uh, with independent oversight by the uh, investigative appeals commissioner, uh, which is independent and judicially led. Monica Lennon to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary hinted at some of the tactics used by undercover police officers. For the avoidance of doubt, this includes sexual violence perpetrated against women by the state, women who were spied on by officers and conned into intimate relationships. The Cabinet Secretary says he has sympathy for individuals if they have suffered due to the uh, actions of undercover police officers. Surely the Cabinet Secretary must see that by denying a public inquiry here in Scotland that his sympathetic words and inaction is an insult to women, their families and other victims. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I've already set out the reasons why I don't believe that a, a public inquiry or inquiry here in Scotland is uh, appropriate and the reasons for that and the rationale uh, behind that decision. I recognise not everyone will agree with that, but I, that's the uh, genuine uh, uh, position I've come to having uh, considered this uh, issue. And I've also highlighted the safeguards which are in place at the present moment. And I would hope that any member in considering uh, this report uh, would recognise the, uh, the safeguards that we have in place within uh, the police service in Scotland and the way in which HMICS have found them to be operating uh, would provide them with reassurance about the ethical standards which they're applying to undercover surveillance operations here in Scotland. John Mason to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. Uh, with the Chief Constable resigning, can the Cabinet Secretary say if the PERC investigation will continue and depending on the outcome of that investigation, would the Chief Constable be subject to appropriate action? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the uh, uh, Police Investigation Review Commission have already stated that, given that the Chief Constable has now resigned with immediate effect from uh, Police Scotland, that their investigation will come to a conclusion and the information that they have obtained to date uh, will be passed on to the Scottish Police Authority uh, to uh, consider. Uh, any decisions relating to actions that are taken thereafter would be entirely a matter for uh, the Scottish uh, Police Authority. Willie Rennie to be followed by Stuart McMillan. It will soon be on our third Chief Constable and we're on our third Chair and third Chief Executive. Surely the Justice Secretary has to start to ask himself whether there's something else going on. Perhaps it's the structure that's the root of the problem here. And no matter who's at the top, we're going to continue to have these problems. So how long is he going to allow this to continue before he acts and institutes some change? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say, President Officer, in relation to two aspects of it, Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland, I uh, believe that a single police force is still the appropriate model for delivering policing in Scotland. And the reality is that had we not moved to a, a single police force in Scotland, that we would have uh, found ourselves having to make significant cuts to frontline policing as a result of the austerity uh, pursued by the UK government and the impact that would have had on such an important public service. In relation to the issues really, uh, around um, uh, the Scottish Police Authority, um, I've always been of the view that there are uh, certainly areas of uh, improvement that can be made by the Scottish Police Authority, and the new chair of the Scottish Police Authority has given a, a very clear commitment uh, around trying to make those changes and those improvements, and to do so at speed. Uh, what I can say to the member is that um, I'm going to provide uh, the new chair with as much support as I can to help to support her and the board in taking forward uh, those changes as and when that is appropriate. Uh, I think it would be appropriate now for all members to give the 
SPA the space in order to, and the new chair the space in order to allow her uh, to take some of these matters. And if the new chair is saying to me that there needs to be changes in the way in which the SPA is constituted and the way in which, uh, uh, the, way in which the, the legislation sets some of these matters out, um, I will certainly consider those matters. I will look at those issues uh, uh, in a serious way uh, uh, and to see how they can improve the way in which the SPA is operated. But that's separate from having moved to a, a single force. But there are certainly areas that can be improved and I think it's now incumbent as all to allow the new chair the space and the opportunity to try and drive forward some of the changes that she wishes to instigate. Uh, and I'll provide her with what support and assistance I can. But alongside that, if she is highlighting to me at some point going forward uh, a need for some form of change that she believes that uh, requires government uh, uh, support in achieving, uh, then I will give that very serious consideration in order to make sure uh, that the body works as effectively as possible. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber what the process and timescale will be to recruit the new Chief Constable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senior Officer, the uh, matter for the recruitment of the new Chief Constable is a matter for the Scottish Police Authority, and it will be for a decision for them to now take forward on instigating the process for uh, that recruitment to be uh, undertaken. In the discussion I had with Susan Deacon earlier today, I know that's an issue that they're already uh, planning to give consideration to, and it will be for the Board to determine what the time frame for that uh, process is. Thank you very much. That concludes our statement. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a, state, a debate on motion 10307 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on stemming the plastic tide. Just to encourage members, I've, I've asked all opening speakers to trim their opening remarks. Uh, even with that, um, because of the level of interest in the previous statement, we are pushed for time. I'm very reluctant to extend decision time beyond 5.30. We've already extended it to 5.30, so I'm reluctant to. So I'd ask all members to try and speak to their time slots or within them.